All right, let's talk about healthcare. Hello, everybody. I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong, and welcome to Brain Club. You share screen, get us oriented. Today, we'll be talking about healthcare and specifically the experience of invalidation and healthcare. Brewing Club, of course, is our intentionally created education space to provide education about ABB's approach to neuroinclusive community culture. This is a place where we bring people together to develop a shared vision of what's possible and contribute to systems change by promoting new ways of thinking and being with the idea that then you go out into your rest of your life and that's how we collectively will change the world. This is a place to feel safe, to experience how culture can be different. It's a place to collectively learn and unlearn together. And though All Brains Belong has lots of different types of programs, this one is not for medical or mental health advice. Even though we'll be talking about healthcare tonight, that sometimes gets confusing. Um, this is a general education about neurodiversity and healthcare, as opposed to a place to like individually talk about individual health. Um, it's not a support group, and it's not the best place to make personalized requests or address personalized needs. This is a place where you're invited to explore today's big picture theme and share ideas or reflections related to that topic. All forms of participation are welcome, all paths to participation. Um, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to sit still or look at the camera or any of those other neuronormative things. So feel free to walk or move or fidget or eat or stim or anything else that needs doing. And you're welcome to communicate with mouth words or type in the chat. Um, you're also welcome to send private chat messages or questions if you prefer. In addition to affirming all aspects of identity, in order to make this safe for all participants, we do prioritize the group's collective needs over that of the individual. And so some of the ways we do that are around being mindful of language used and being mindful of, of access needs. Access needs being anything that is required to meaningfully and fully participate in one's environment or community. Everyone with all types of brains has access needs whether that relate to the physical environment or emotional or communication or interpersonal, lots of different types of access needs. And some of the, some of the ones that play out here at Brain Club um, uh, related to communication um, processing time. So we'll, we'll intentionally try to take some pauses today to give, give processing time. We'll also just make space for lots of people to be able to participate in their own way. And of course, observation is a completely valid form of participation here. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on at your end if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And I actually, for a change, already have the chat box open. So that's your chat window if you're looking for yours. Speaking of the chat, one of the uh, things that comes up sometimes is conflicting access needs related to the chat. Because just as we have so many uh, community members who the chat is a way of, of being able to access Brain Club. It's a way of being able to communicate without mouth words. It's a way of getting ideas out without burdening working memory, um, allows for more processing time that, you know, 10 minutes later, you have a thought, you don't have to wait for it to make sense. Just in conversation, you just get it out. Um, and so just as, as that happens, it's also the case that we have community members for whom the chat is really overwhelming. It's visually cluttered. It can be distracting. Many people even have a startle response when the chat pops up, especially when it moves really quickly. So some of the ways that we uh, suggest navigating conflicting access needs um, are either to, after it pops up, if you're someone who's bothered by the popping up, um, don't close it. Try leaving it open so that it, um, it, it the, the text will keep refreshing, but it won't pop again. Or you can disable chat preview entirely by clicking on the up carrot and it'll say show chat previews and you tap on that and the check marks will go away. And so you won't have to deal with that anymore. Okay. Whew. 
we're continuing our May theme of unpacking internalized ableism. Uh, last week, we had a really rich conversation um, hearing from many of our community members about their experience of internalized ableism um, and the consequences of invalidation um, growing up, uh, particularly as an, uh, a late identified neurodivergent person. And experiences of invalidation are common which leads us to today's conversation. Um, so uh, before I we've, before I introduce um, today's uh, panelists and the topic of our panel, I first just want to take a moment to thank our monthly Brain Club supporters um, who make it possible for us to be able to um, put together panels like today and be able to compensate uh, panelists for sharing uh, lived expertise. Actually, one more thing before we start. Um, save the date. We have our next special event webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. Practical strategies for delivering neuroinclusive health care. Um, uh, this just just like we did a couple of weeks ago. This is going to be one of those special events where we uh, invite people from outside the ABB community to come and learn uh, with the idea that um, uh, systems change, right? So the more people that we introduce to how to how to how to do the thing. Um, the more people are then able to access health care um, when they need it, the type of health care that they need. Okay, here we go. But first, a content warning. We are going to be talking about health care. And that, for many people, that, that requires a content warning because many people have the experience of distress in healthcare settings, trauma in healthcare settings, ableism in healthcare settings, and uh, post-traumatic stress disorder uh, related to their healthcare experiences. Because what we know is that neurodivergent people often struggle to access healthcare. We know that, you know, specifically uh, related to autistic adults, for example, 80% of autistic adults struggle to access primary care amongst people who already have a primary care practice. 80%, they have a doctor, they just can't access the care. Not surprisingly, um, nearly 70% of autistic adults have untreated health problems. And we know that both autistic and ADHD adults die earlier than non-autistic, non-ADHD adults. And we know that um, often medical professionals do not receive the training the, the knowledge, skills, and attitudes required to be able to provide um, the care that many neurodivergent people need. We also know that autistic and ADHD people are far more likely to experience a constellation of intertwined medical problems related to multiple systems in the body. And much like this picture shows, um, these things are all intertwined, and sometimes some of the standard medical management of some parts of this cluster make the other parts worse, which is why it's really important to zoom out and think about the this constellation, this grouping as a whole, as opposed to fragmenting the body parts in the way that the healthcare system um, so um, commonly drives and that the healthcare system really does get in the way of clinicians being able to take care of the whole the whole person within a 10 minute visit. These are some examples of uh, some of the components of the constellation of intertwined medical problems, um, including uh, hypermobility, um, dysautonomia, mast cell disease, sleep disorders, fibromyalgia, migraine, endometriosis, myalgic encephalomyelitis, long COVID. Um, there's a lot of really common things and they're not 40 separate things. They are intertwined. Um, and so um, before I introduce um, the, our, our, our panel for tonight, I just do wanna also share um, uh, this resource. This is something that All Brains Belong released last summer with support from the Organization on Autism Research and HRSA. Um, our Everything's Connected to Everything, Improving the Healthcare of Autistic and ADHD Adults. This is a, a set of um, free resources, uh, uh, both for, for, for patients and professionals. And I'll put the link to the full resource. Okay, there we go. 
What we've learned through the process of creating this resource and enrolling it out and in dialoguing with clinicians who are learning about this for the first time um, is that, you know, we've been really impressed. You know, we've been really impressed by how open um, many professionals have been that when, um, when the information is presented in a way that works for the brain of the listener, um, uh, it, it, it uh, very often the perspective taking um, that the healthcare system interferes with um, is made possible. And so a lot, of, a lot of what we try to do here at All Brains Belong is bridging the double empathy problem. The double empathy problem is a term coined by Dr. Damian Milton, who is an autistic social scientist in the UK, um, referring to when there is a mismatch between communication style and worldview, that is where communication breakdowns take place. And oh my goodness, there is such a double empathy problem in healthcare. So tonight we're gonna to be revisiting some brain clubs of yesteryear. Uh, we're gonna be integrating um, some, uh, some of our past community panels um, of clinicians and um, non-clinician community members um, to, to really directly try to bridge the double empathy problem. All right, so we've got clinician perspectives, patient perspectives, and um, it is it is it is our hope that we can um, then 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 have a discussion about some of the themes that emerge. Um, and so, uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, Dr. Laura Bujold, Cass Ackley, Synthesis Graham, Sarah Knudsen, Matthew Lafleur, Dr. Tim Lishnak, Sierra Miller, Amy Noyes. Linda Riddle, Dr. Gabe Borzella, and Zeph. So with that, David, take it away. A lot of patients who have this constellation of intertwined conditions, they have a lot of, um, you know, negative healthcare experiences, they feel that they have been invalidated, dismissed, that people didn't, you know, they didn't get it, they didn't hear them. Um, you know, do, do you, what do you, what do you think of that? I, I, I you know, that's been a, a, a journey of discovery for myself in, in that I, I think as a, as a physician, we, we hold ourselves to, I need to have the answer. And, and if I don't have the answer, that's going to be unacceptable to the patient. And, and working with these folks, they, they, that's not their expectation. I, this is the only time in my life I would say that I've actually felt not only heard, but listened to, and just treated like a human. Like they just want someone that will listen to them and work with them. And Probably this stuff that's going on in my body makes sense. I don't know how to make sense of it, but probably it's out there and there's a way to make sense of it. I just don't have the tools. And partly that was my search with healthcare providers. But then the more healthcare providers I went to, the more I began to doubt whether that knowing was possible. And I didn't feel confident like they got what was going on in my body. The ways that I would try to express that did not register for them as concerns or they do do a test and it wouldn't show much in, in a medical sense and that would be the end of it. One of the things that I've been thinking about, this is like a brand new thought that came to me today. I was meeting, I'm, I'm working with this research group that is um, looking at autistic people with, with basically with all the things, with multiple chronic health yeah. conditions that are intertwined. And it's a, it's a qualitative study of like they're telling like the, the participants all like told their story and it was like content analysis of their narratives, which is super cool. Um, and what came out, what's coming out um, is the main finding is that these patients describe that in all of their years of failed healthcare interactions, um, they felt that they were not believed. But that was the core unifying lens. And so they come in and they have the stories of, you know, they were invalidated and dismissed and shut down. They were told, go lose weight. They were this, they were that, like just all of that. And it's really interesting because 
uh, when I hear these stories from my patients, um, which is like almost all of my patients tell that story when they come as new patients for the first time, like it's, um, I can see where the stories as they tell them um, that, that maybe, um, how do I say this? Like someone else might not have experienced that as invalidation or dismissal, but these patients, especially these late identified neurodivergent adults, they have been invalidated and dismissed and shamed by so many people in their lives. And so they come in and doctor says, um, you know, well, your tests are normal. And now it's this trauma response, which I think is a unique barrier to healthcare access and engagement that, I don't know, I don't, I certainly didn't get taught that in medical school. What do you, what do you Nobody believes you. And then there are different levels of that in, you know, well, you look at it wrong or you couldn't possibly know yourself because you're this subgroup or that subgroup. And then there are the ones where, well, they, everybody looks fine. So it has to be fine. And I found that a lot as a parent that I would know something was wrong, but my kids didn't look disabled. Oh, no. they looked cute and perfect and just the right amount of chubby. But no, no, I'm just one of those moms. Yes, the difficulty healthcare system for me was the physicians of <clears throat> trying to understand my complexity of my learning knowledge and how I learn and how can they adapt to my learning. For me, it's more about, you know, not only speaking to them on that same level, which is very, very tricky, but also complexity of the healthcare system. The healthcare system is so complex, even the people in it have trouble understanding it. System, right? The system thwarts everybody. So, so like you're seeing this and you're recognizing that everything's connected. Um, and yet a lot of these patients, they've seen lots of clinicians. Um, yeah. What do you think um, gets in the way of professionals not making those connections? Um, I, I think it's the dynamic between the provider and the patient. So the few patients that come to mind, I think there's something behavioral or mood related. And unfortunately, I think the patient is angry. What I've experienced as a, as a barrier is a patient is angry and frustrated and fed up because they've been either objectively, obviously discriminated against, told off, told that they're not being taken seriously, um, or, and so they develop this defense layer. So, and that I think in some cases can also be some of the pathology, like I think fibromyalgia is another good example as a comorbid condition here. And then there's this overlap of some uh, psychiatric diagnoses too. I'm probably a bit jaded when it comes to the healthcare uh, community. I'll be a bit honest, just because of all the years of, I do feel like I wasn't listened to. I feel like in some ways it's, there's still very much kind of like, you know, the hysterical woman or AFAB stereotype. Some doctors just, they don't want to listen. They go, oh, well, you're woman presenting. Have you perchance thought it's just, you know, anxiety? A lot of different symptoms show up in the different systems of the body that were fundamentally neurologically related. On COVID, you know, and other, you know, uh, medical issues like asthma uh it's you know it's very common but it's also things that should never be ignored in the medical profession field because those could complicate you know the lifespan of an autistic adult or a child even though i talked with them about the other symptoms of the autism 
my symptoms were brushed off as PTSD. And this is where I would love to learn from you because I don't think I fully understand and maybe I don't see the same population fully represented as you do too. Um, some people are in hiding, some people do not come to the doctor, um, but usually they're angry, frustrated, discriminated against, fed up. Um, I would probably agree with that. I ended up finding you guys out of desperation because nobody else would listen to me. And I do notice that, especially, like I said, with like, you know, women and AFABs, it's, it's really hard sometimes to get care or appropriate uh, care. I think about neurodivergent nervous systems and, you know, all neurodivergent folks are a very heterogeneous group, of course, but when I think about, um, like, even sensory processing, like the sensory systems um, that are either taking in more information than other people or less information than other people, an energy system, I think, um, the the neuroception system, the threat detection system, there are a lot of people who are extra sensitive to threat. And it's like acquired trauma physiology, um, that hypervigilance, that like looking. So, so, so if I'm someone who has hypersensitive neuroception and I enter a healthcare encounter, there's going to be something that someone's going to say or do that is, I'm more likely to experience this threat because of these cues from the environment, my lived experience, the, 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 the vibe. I can just feel when I walk in, I don't know if it's a safe space for me being neurodivergent, but I also don't know if it's a safe space because of the way that I'm going to be treated and, and disregarded in terms of like, just go lose weight. Still wasn't happy with my care. Um, I have been dealing with chronic pain. I would say consistently. I mean, it's been intermittent my whole life, but it really became, I would say, a staple. I think I was probably 22, 23. And, you know, I remember going to my doctor, trying to talk to her about it. And she also thought that I was just so tense and anxious for so long that it was causing my muscles to freak out essentially and be, yes, this tense. And that's why I was in such chronic pain um as we know it's not it's eds because you guys diagnosed me um and i said everything to a bloody t as does my mom <laughs> so i was like literally when we were doing the checklist i was like well this really does explain a lot especially since it really is all the things you know you're you're bringing up the barriers that happen, um, like the barriers to access while they're there. So yeah. the, you know, the, 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 but, but there's so many barriers that even prevent them from getting there. Yeah. So you must pick up the phone to become an, to, to become a new, you know, to make an appointment, you yeah. the executive functioning of like all the, all, all those pieces too. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you mentioned trauma, you know, all these people with healthcare trauma, it's like, well, I made the appointment, but I'm going to cancel it last minute because like my limbic system tells me that it's not safe to come back to this place. I have medical PTSD. So when I think of the healthcare experiences that I've had, a lot of them have been very challenging, particularly from communications perspectives, trying to make myself understood to the doctor. I can think of a few people who probably either avoid care or even are discharged because of no shows and things like that. And it's terrible. It shouldn't be. I think about all the people that when they don't come to appointments, it's like, oh, well, they know show, they don't care, they're not engaged in their health care. But it's like, okay, whoa, um, it's maybe because of their disability that they don't know they have. You don't know they have, and they don't know they have these invisible disabilities. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just the systems within the systems already have, like, there's right there's standard expectation like this is how you communicate this is how you take information like you know people people teach you how to how to take notes like yes. when you're in when you're in school here's how here's how you study something without ever knowing how your brain works like and and then you try to fit yourself and mold your brain and your way your whole way of being into the box that who knows who designed it but the box that has become like the, the standard expectation of how, how to communicate, 
how to interact, how to socialize, how to just exist, how to be within the workplace. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's suffocating. Yeah. I mean, I remember even like as a pre-med student, like, you know, my volunteer gigs or like some of my jobs after college before medical school, like it was just so clear that there was judgment going on and that, that what you just said, like, you know, that there's one right way to do the thing. There's one, like, like, it was just so clear that it was not okay to show up as, as one's true self, not, not just as, as a professional, like as a patient, like, I remember being like a young 20 something. And I remember being like, you know, oh, I hope, like, I have to do something. I have to do something to make sure they don't think I'm weird or that I'm like melodramatic or that, you know, anyway, I have all the things. I have all the things. I've always had all the things. Um, I, I, as a patient, I've never, you know, I, I, I've never had care for my all the things because I never tell anyone my all the things because that's a surefire where to get judged. <laughs> yes. When you think about your experiences trying to access healthcare, what comes to mind? It's very hard to access health healthcare. I think it's hard in general. I think our system is broken um, for pretty much everyone. But the amount of additional layers that come when you have, you know, and in, in, in a way, any type of disability, just it, it makes it truly a monumental problem. I think systemic ableism is like so embedded in medical training and, and, and practice. Act in this way, communicate in this way, or you will go unheard. Yes. Like you have to, you have to, communicate a certain way or, or you, you won't be heard and not everybody can make that adjustment. And so those are the, those are the people that are staying away from healthcare because it's overwhelming or confusing or uncomfortable or unsafe to. Them. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I feel like I say that so commonly, like if, if I'm talking to somebody about like being in a pre-diabetic range and before I even say anything, they start with, but I eat well and I've been struggling with my weight in my entire life and like preface it with like, I'm doing all the things, please don't blame it on me being at fault or, or blame it on my weight. Um, and it's just so ingrained in patients to kind of preface a visit with these are all the things that I'm doing because otherwise it's so common for it to because that's how we learn. That's we learn that diabetes is lifestyle factor related, and that's the only thing. Versus inflammation and genetics and all the other things. And mast cells. To do to it, right, right, and that like weight isn't always totally changeable. Well, it's also that like I mean, I mean, this is this is like such a bigger picture like so not only is there a right way to be a person but but like the message that there's a right way to be healthy too and like so you know when you think about like all of the anti-fat bias and shaming that goes on in the healthcare system i mean it starts in childhood i mean it's just it's yeah. it's so bad I'm terrified to go I, I think there's a lot of assumptions being a fat person and um, so like if I go get my, um, blood pressure checked or something like that, there's this like quality of, oh, I can't believe that you have normal blood pressure. Like the, just like the things that people are saying to me, you know, I just recently had a routine mammogram and like what was said to me during that appointment was incredibly inappropriate. You know, we're supposedly, you know, a society where we're supposed to take care of ourselves and be informed and make decisions and be self-actualized and everything. And even if you're all those things, and in many ways, if you are those things, healthcare isn't designed to work for you. You know, it's sort of designed for you show up and they send you places and put you in little cubbies and folders. And if you actually are like, no, uh, 
this that that doesn't actually affect me this over here affects me nobody quite knows what to do with you doctors i don't think are really taught how to work with patients who don't fit the the expectations of you know what the profile is they're trained to make decisions in a very specific way they need to in order to be really good with their time uh, because nobody else lives in your body but you right right so you would think after a certain amount of time you would become an expert in it yeah i mean that's kind of how i look at mine yeah thanks knowing that just because somebody shows up in front of you and may appear normalish enough but there needs to be given some amount of space or grace to allow for the fact that maybe this person has other things going on that you don't know about right so it's like this self-selected group of people whose needs were not met by the traditional healthcare system they are um you know so it's it's and certainly not a homogenous group of people by any means but amongst that group whose needs were not met they were more likely to be autistic and or ADHD, and they were more likely to have this, this constellation. So Where it's hard not to feel angry sometimes because in retrospect, the signs were very obvious and they were there. Um, but due to where medicine was at at the time and lack of research and the stigma, it just didn't happen. But now it did. And honestly, like, I, you have a completely different life. So a new patient comes in and like I've done um, on my like new patient intake forms. Um, I, I screen for all the things for all my new patients. Um, so I'll say, you know, I noticed that you had X, Y, Z, A, B, C. Did you know um, that there's actually a grouping or a cluster of intertwined medical conditions? Um, and I usually, you know, whether they're, you know, if they're in person, I'm like, you know, turning my laptop, if they're virtual, I'm sure screen, and I show them a visual support. I think visual supports to sort of like anchor what you're talking about. I think, I think most brains benefit from visual supports. So, 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 so um, the majority of patients who, who, who come to All Brains Belong, they struggle with a grouping of medical conditions that involves something in the connective tissue bucket, something in the GI bucket, something in the sleep bucket, something in the, you know, pain bucket. And, and, and like, you see them, they're like, the mouth drops and their eyes are wide. And you're like, you know, and I'm like, oh, do you, do you, do you think that applies to you? Like, I don't know. Like, they're like, that's me. Like, like a, like a thousand percent of the time. That's what they say. I say, honestly, the other patients, like, it's really nice one like, there's always a sense of belonging even if we don't know each other because we all know realistically we're here for like similar things adjacent things because really it kind of is all the things your body is not just one system you know independent from another it's one very interesting very cool but very finicky machine one more question yeah. um do you have any advice for someone who is where you were a year or so ago and they feel like stuck and they've had all this bad health care and they just like health care that's that like unhelpful thing that traumatizes me and invalidates me do you have any advice for people who are in that spot i know it's difficult and i know it's really hard to trust people especially doctors when you've been you know lied to dismissed hell even gaslit we've all been there um you can trust the you can trust the doctors at Auburn, so, like, they get it. You guys get it. You do. You know how to help, but more importantly, you have compassion, you have empathy, and honestly, I find that that is missing in a lot of bedsides, in doctors, in nurse practitioners, in our healthcare community, and I think just knowing that you guys get it and you're willing to listen and will help, I think even if somebody is very, very reticent about reaching out this is your sign it's worth it it's also my cat so there you go the cat the cat is in agreement i wonder if you have any advice for people who are in a place of struggle and they they don't know what's possible of course because they've never seen it what do you say to people who don't feel don't 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 necessarily feel safe 
enough to try something different. Don't have to, you know, whether that be like, you know, uh, trying a group medical visit, trying brain club, like trying, because you don't trust other people. Why would I want to be around other people? Other people suck. That's been my experience. I get the, the terror and the pain of hope. In a medical system that treats you like a problem and treats you like you're making stuff up and treats you like, yeah, a problem instead of a person. The best I can offer for someone who has been hurt and gaslit and not believed. is be brave once more. Once more, because you will be believed at All Brains Belong. And it's like being in a completely different world. Okay, I heard you saying no sound. It's me not being able no to sound. generate. It's just me not being able to generate sound. It's me like opening my mouth and having a hard time getting my words out. Um, that last video clip was, it gets me every time. was really good. Thank you. I have an appointment, a phone appointment tomorrow with a sleep doctor who has been a gaslighter. And um, so I'm just going to be brave. Oh. I think another important thing um, Mary and, and everyone in that in that situation is the idea that when you are surrounded by people who get it, it is our hope that that contributes like a little bit of not complete protection, but like a little protection emotionally from when you're in a situation and someone says something that is invalidating and dismissive, when you can recognize that your truth is exactly the way you know it to be, That is a very different place from um, a place where dismissive comments lead to people questioning their own reality. Yeah, and um, what she would with that doctor, the first doctor with the long blonde hair, which she said about that people kind of have some anger, you know, and I think that I did, you know, I'm 59 and um, I, I am angry and I can, my first thought was, okay, I'm gonna go unmasked and just, you know, I'm like a verbal Viking. <laughs> so, But that, you know, cause I should just fire him, you know, but. I don't know, but that's not productive. So what I've started to say is, thank you for helping me with this one thing. I know I'm a complicated patient. You know, I have everything. And um, so I, I haven't really figured out. And I thought about 
getting my partner to sit there with me because I know the research shows that if there's a man in the room, that women get better treatment. <laughs> so I just have him on the call. You know, it's not a big deal. Like he won't refill my my yeah. CPAP yeah. supplies. So anyway, sorry. I don't want to go into detail. I just thank you everybody for the space. Yeah. Yeah, Mary, you're not alone. There's so many people who've been in this situation. Um, I think the the one of the things that you were getting to at the end there, that I I think um, you know, some of the advice that that or the some of the conversations we have with other community members around being really focused about what you're wanting to get out of a healthcare encounter. Yeah. Like I am looking to get my X refilled, right? Like I'm not looking for someone to understand the big picture of my, all the things I am going in with a very specific objective. And can I communicate in a way that can lead to that? And right. can I figure out what I need to be able to communicate? Um, whether that is preparing things ahead of time with a script or bringing a support person, like you've said, I think that's all really important. Yes, Thanks, Mary. Uh, thank you. And and I first heard of you on Annie Crow's um, podcast where she was talking about- Oh, that's about... awesome. Annie, Annie Crow's yeah. coming live here next week is our special We're... guest next week. That's um, great. So... That's that's great. Where she, she said about going to the doctor, how she doesn't know what details are important. So she gives all the details. So yeah. I've been do, I've been doing better with that. Like I tried to yeah. just really because I don't know I'm not a doctor. You know I don't know. I, I, yeah. I so anyway I'm glad you're having her. She's wonderful and that episode with you is so good. Oh thanks Mary, Sierra and then Monique. Um I I just wanted to I think basically bounce off what you said Mary. I think that there's. Well, I think a lot of times when, when I'm talking to other clinicians, people think, oh, well, I just, you know, I don't have these people in my practice. I don't have adult autistic patients in my practice. And um, I think that from both the clinician end, but also from the patient end, like people don't, people don't know what, what you can ask for and what you can need and what your access needs might be or what accommodations might be available. Because if, if we've never been offered them, we're not going to know them. Um, and so the more people who you know, are able to and have the tools to be able to do that in, in provider settings. I think it really, it makes it, it makes it more feasible for everybody. Um, it's just how, how showing up as your authentic self can really make a huge difference. I think not having an official diagnosis makes me feel less confident about that. I know that's, I just, anyway, if anybody ever knows of somebody who can diagnose women <laughs> in New England. I'm in Massachusetts and my appointment tomorrow is at Mass Ioneer. But anyway, I just keep waiting to hear word of mouth that there's somebody who can diagnose women who are high masking and all the things. Okay. Thank See you, later. everybody. Does anybody else struggle with anger? Like, like I, yeah. I Mary, really Mary, get Mary. I do. I just so need to, I need to interrupt angry. you just because someone else has been waiting. Oh, to, I'm so sorry. Let me. That's okay. Let Thank me, you. Uh, yeah. No, that's okay. Thanks, Monique. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm in Canada, so my my um medical appointments I think are different I don't know I've never been to an American doctor but I have the benefit of I see a specialist every two months for a different a different thing but thankfully I get to see her for 30 to 45 minutes that's how long our appointments are and they're actually too long for me um energetically but anyhow my doctor that I had for 30 years 29 years retired and I got a new doctor last summer and it was just right around the time where I connected with all brains belong and you're a wonderful resource so I prepared myself for the visit with my doctor I made a card I typed out a card that said I'm overwhelmed right now and I can't speak 
can I, I, I wrote, I'm, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling defensive and I'm scared and I can't talk right now. Can I send you an email later to tell you what's happening right now to explain it? And so I had that card ready so the doctor could say yes or no <laughs> to my request. And then I also, before my visit, I emailed the resource that All Brains has created for doctors. So I sent that before. This doctor, um, and then I also, after that first visit, she, that did happen. I did get overwhelmed and I put my yellow card on, the, on her desk and she acknowledged it and she respected it. And, um, and then also, I've also sent, she's allowed me to email her things because I, I, because sometimes in the appointment, I get overwhelmed and I get confused. And so she's allowed me to email before an appointment to be prepared. And my last email I sent her, I had a visit with her two weeks ago. I sent her my sensory requests. I said, look, our, at our last visit, there were the overhead lights in the office really um, oh, taxed my brain. I got tired very quickly and I couldn't concentrate on what you were saying. So next time, can we meet in an office that has natural lighting and turn off the lights? And she said, yeah. She said, I didn't even realize. So I guess just it's been baby steps and it's been hard, but I made cards to to start to communicate when when I don't have the words because I do experience mutism. And um, I just wanted to share that. Yeah, thank you. It's a oh, great Monique, idea. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. Right, it's the it's 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 so hard, right? That it has fallen to you to come up with your own accommodations and your own workarounds for bridging these gaps. And I so admire that you've been able to do that and that you're sharing these ideas with other people. I think it's it's so hard. People don't know what you're allowed to ask for. Um, you, people may not even know what they need. Um, and and that that is that is so hard. Um, you know, one of the things that 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 we hope to accomplish um, with our webinar in June um, by presenting some of the really concrete details of what what we offer, what we do here. It's the idea that like hopefully, you know, whether it's a, a clinician who's now learned something they can offer people um, or, or, or maybe even more likely that, you know, someone who's not a clinician is like, oh, I could ask for that. Oh, wow, look at that, I can ask for that. So thank you, Monique. Sarah. Yeah, I was actually gonna just kind of bounce off that, you know, as we talk about um, uh, learning, not really knowing what your access needs are, um, and going in and, and hearing other people offer menus through things like All Brains Belong and saying, oh, I didn't even know that was an access need of mine. And so like when I took my kids to the first vaccine clinic that we went to through All Brains Belong, um, just having this menu of options and being like, oh, and I never would have thought to ask for some of these things to make the experience go better. Um, but what I found was similar to what you were saying, Monique, like taking that information back to more perhaps like traditional situations in healthcare and having that information, uh, knowing what what might might make the experience work better. Um, and so bringing tools ourselves or knowing to ask for those things uh, to make it a better experience. And I, I feel like at Brain Club, that's what this is about, is like learning from other people, hearing about, you know, other people's experiences. And I do feel like um, it sort of gives me strength to go back to my regular life and like have that information and know that like there's a lot of other people who would benefit from having these menus of of options. Um, we had a recent um, experience adventure as a family and I was telling Mel about um, 
previewing and like the idea of previewing something ahead of time. So seeing pictures of where we're going to and then even actually driving to the place and seeing it in person and kind of walking around and checking it out. And I never knew that that was an access need of mine. And it was only through my children that I was like, oh, this is really helpful for them. Oh, wait, I think this might have actually always been helpful for me. And I've always kind of done it, but not really known that there were words for it. And so, um, so yeah, I think that, you know, just being, having the experience of knowing that there are options for things and that there are a lot of other people who have also struggled to have their needs met and are trying to figure out what their access needs are and having language to go with that, you know, has really been helpful for me and my family as well. sharing that Sarah no it's kind of like you, oh, I don't want to say most because I don't have any data to support this but like many and certainly me um you know the experience of like I don't know what my access needs are until they're not met and then I'm like oh I guess I needed that thing um or um I have the idea that when something goes wrong that you can kind of rewind and say, oh, you know, this this was an unmet access need situation. Um, or if there are things that actually feel comfortable, you know, or, they're like, or even neutral, you know, do, is that a clue about access? Um, and so I think I think that it's that's part of part of the the reflection process, the self-discovery process. pause and give space uh david yeah it's interesting in one of the support groups that i've i've worked in the past is they actually for they made up these signs that says please mask for this patient and they had little suction cups and it was stick it out on the door before the doctor came in and a lot of them have had success with people coming in doing that which i thought was really cool and um then a weird trick that I've learned over the years, because I've been to the, the hospitals in ER over the last decades a lot, and that is how I dress up and how I present makes a huge difference on how they respect me. And I actually remember one time I got into my my dress clothes, my work clothes, you know, with my, not a tie, but, you know, not, nice shirt. And it's amazing how weird an effect that it has. It's, it's, it's sad at the same time, but it, it's made a difference. That is incredibly um, distressing, um, and yet I'm not surprised at all. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I just want to pause to create some some space for anyone who hasn't had a chance to share either in the chat or out loud Ariana's comment in the chat, hearing others' experiences is so helpful to me and gets me thinking about my own experiences for the whole week until the next brain club. It's invaluable. That's awesome. That's awesome. Heather, can you tell us about, Heather's asking about, about visible. I don't know about that. Hello, everybody. Um, so it basically it's a heart rate uh, variability monitor. Um, it's by the, the polar verity people or the, is the actual device, but it's connected to this app and it was developed by some people that um, had chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, among you know long COVID, I think were like the main things that it was developed for. But you know, people with all the things um, definitely qualify for this as well. Um, but they found that the higher your heart rate variability 
the more healthy you probably were and the lower it was, the, the less healthy you probably were. So it gives me uh, pacing points and allows me to pace my day um, and sees how I'm doing in the morning um, with like a morning check-in um, and tells me like, you know, if I'm at like a two or a three or, you know, what to expect for the day, if I need to just lay low or not. Um, and then the last thing that is that I really think is cool is it, it's symptom tracks. So I can go through it and put like, you know, I had at night I go through and tell them about how my day was, um, essentially. And then it has like a functional capacity thing every month as well. And that you can like blast it all into a PDF after 30 days and it tracks everything. It's really, really, really cool. Really cool. Thank you for sharing that. You know, one of the things that, um, that, by the way, when, when, if you go to the everything's connected to everything, improving the healthcare of autistic and ADHD adults project, the, all the things project, you see that there's a, there's a, a choice. Um, actually, I mean, I can, let me give you, a, I can give you a tour. I think I meant to do that. And then I forgot, you know, brain. Um, what I was going to say about that is it's freely available. Um, so whether you're a clinician or not, you have access to the clinician resources. Um, and so one of the things that you'll find on the clinician guide um, is it talks about the different components of all the things and, and some of the ways that, that we approach this and um, what you just heard about with, with pacing, activity pacing and avoiding post-exertional malaise um, ends up being like a really, really important and not optional part of managing all the things. Um, the other thing I wanna show you about this is if you come to the individual and community member side, you'll see this, um, bring this letter. So you can print this out bring this to your primary care clinician at your next appointment and just hand it. Um, we have found, we've gotten feedback that it works the best when you let the letter attempt to bridge the double empathy problem for you. It's a letter that was very intentionally written um, in language that primary care clinicians are used to receiving. It was peer reviewed by primary care clinicians in the traditional environment who didn't previously know about this project. Um, so we've, we've gotten really good feedback that this, this letter when used as a tool, not a whole bunch of other stuff printed out, not a whole bunch of other information, just as a standalone tool, um, I, I, uh, that, that, that's how we would recommend using it. So, so with, with that, um, I, I really appreciate all of you being here, being part of, of this conversation, being part of this community. Um, because like I was sharing before, it's like being around people who get it, hopefully insulates you and makes it easier to be in spaces where people don't get it because it's not you. It never was. Um, and so next week, um, we will be joined by a uh, guest presenter, Annie Crow, um, who is an autistic human rights attorney joining us from Australia. She, she, she came to Brain Club about a year ago. She's coming back live um, to present on invisible disability and internalized ableism and employment. So uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. Have a good week. Bye.